what's coming up on your horizon. Well, it's remarkable the difference a good job can make in someone's life. Today, we begin with the story of an Oklahoman who isn't letting anything stand in the way of her and a good job. Blaine Singletary shows us how some educators are trying to interest young females in an electrifying career option. Courtney May looks at the feminine touch underway in Oklahoma's capital restoration. I'll talk to the state capital project manager about what the price tag is on a century of neglect. There, the attempts at repairs in the past were, were really poor and they were poorly thought out. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech. A job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, if you've ever had to look for work, you know that finding a job can be a job into itself, which makes the accomplishments of a group of Oklahomans honored at the state capitol all the more special. As Austin Moore reports, amid all the doom and gloom surrounding the state's broken budget, there are still those making it work. There may be dark economic clouds gathering around the Capitol, but today, beneath the dome, a celebration is underway for those who battle against the storm. There are people in here who have gone above and beyond for others, or maybe there are people in here that took a chance on somebody. Leslie Brown is reason, the president of the Oklahoma Career and Technical Education Equity Council a body focused on economic empowerment of single parent families. The key is remove the barrier, the, the student will do the work. This celebration, known as Making It Work Day, holds up both those lifted and those that do the lifting. Jennifer Wilcox was honored. Well now I have a job and I work full time where I was just taking care of my son and I have a degree. I have credentials behind my name where I didn't have them before. You know, we stand up here, all of us, for one reason, and that's to make that individual take ownership of his or her life. As was Jeff together. Foster and the Four uh, Tribes Consortium to to of that's Oklahoma. It, it, it means that what we do every day, someone sees. Pride and gratitude mix equally in this atmosphere. It's hard for me to put into words how thankful I am. Sorry. For Christina Byler, this is a day to reflect on how far she has come and who helped her get here. It means the world to me. You mean the world to me. I'll never forget the first day she came into my office. She was very tentative, very unsure of herself. I could sense, though, that there was something about her. She wanted more, but she just didn't really believe she could have more. As the director of Moore Norman Technology Center's HELP program, Becky Wood has made a career of shepherding wayward souls. Career Tech, of course, provides the perfect medium in which to grow people and to be able to present other possibilities to them. But when people see their own potential, then all we have to do is just run alongside and give them the tools and open the doors. Doors shut and locked were all Christina Byler was expecting when she arrived at Moore Norman. I was hopeless. I was broke. Um, broken. Youthful mistakes and an unfortunate relationship had taken Christina down a dark road, damaging her relationships with family and eventually landing her in county jail. But though discouraged, Christina wasn't beaten and she learned from that experience. Maybe that was what was for me, you know, so that I just wouldn't do it again. Made, made me stronger, you know, more determined to, to do things differently. Even things that are really dark and painful, they, they have value. Domestic violence can teach you a lot. Uh, your bad choices can teach you a lot. And I think it's how people's character is formed. And I actually think that some of my best success stories have been people who've had the toughest journeys. 
And Christina's journey showed just how determined she was. She rode a one-speed bicycle to get here to school for more. I want to say it was about 11 miles round trip that she had to ride. It was a cruiser, was what my sister gave me, you know, those with the basket and the big handlebars. And they're super cute, not for a distance ride, <laughs> no. But with that persistence and finding the right program, Christina is now thriving in industry, where she works for CPNY as a CAD technician, developing plans for bridges. We make this the actual set that the, the builders and construction works, workers go off of. David Neuhauser is Christina's supervisor. He says their company is far less interested in who Christina once was than they are in who she is today. Things that we looked at when we heard about her um, was not just that she was uh, one of the head of her class as far as the performance goes CAD-wise, but that she was a leader and that she was really driven. And so when she came in and talked to us, she was able to present herself and we just, we could tell that she was hungry for, for work, you know, and, and would work hard. I just want to do a really good job because I'm so thankful for the opportunity. Like, cause I'm living the dream right now, you know? It feels like I'm Cinderella, like I'm the Cinderella story, but not a princess. Royalty or not, Christina Byler is certain making it work. Now, including Christina, altogether 17 Oklahomans and five Oklahoma businesses and nonprofits were honored at the 22nd annual Making It Work Day at the state capitol. And Christina, well, she's not alone in her career choice. When we return, we meet some women who are playing key roles in Oklahoma's capital restoration. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Well, after a century of heavy use, Oklahoma State Capitol is in the midst of the first ever top to bottom restoration project. We'll have more on that later in our show, but first we want to continue our look at the world of work by looking at the role women are playing in the renovation of the state's most iconic building. Joining me now is our Courtney May. When the Oklahoma State Capitol building was built in 1917, it was a construction team consisting of only men. Fast forward a century and that's all changed. The women who are a part of the Capitol Restoration are helping change Oklahoma's history. The Oklahoma State Capitol building is being restored, and there's more than just men at work in this construction zone. Meet the women behind the facelift of this historical project. I chose Manhattan when I went to work because they were very clear that they were hiring me and whatever the task at hand they asked me to do, it had no bearing on whether I was a man or a woman. I just feel like I'm one of the guys and go to work every day and, and that's how we operate. Andrea Gossard, project manager for Manhattan Construction says, it's about having the skills it takes to be in this profession. One thing and one thing only rules in this industry and that is being very well educated in what you're doing. Um, I work with guys that have been in the field doing the same job for 30 years and they know a lot about it. The second they realize that you know a lot about it too, they respect you. Gossard is one of many women turning heads in an industry predominantly ran by men while creating some friendly competition at the work site. I guess they're not used to seeing women in, in the construction field, so when, when we do get out in the field and we're able to hold our own and, and get the job done just as well as any other you know, male counterpart, um, I think that just gives them you know, a bit more enthusiasm, like, hey, you know, they can get out there and do it just like everybody else can. And Boyce says it's an honor to work on a century-year-old building that has so much historical significance. That's got to be one of the most historical projects here in the state alone. Um, the significance behind it, you know, being a hundred-year-old building that hasn't had a lot of work done to it over the last few years other than, you know, the, the dome is quite interesting, I think, and fascinating that I can be a part of that history going forward and being able to drive by it and say I was part of the team that, that did that restoration. Preservation, construction, architecture, and project planning these women working on the Capitol Project are at the top of their field and are changing the look of Oklahoma. 
This is going to transcend Oklahoma. It's going to touch a lot of people. It's going to touch a lot of lives, and it's, it's nice to be a part of that. So Courtney, not only are these women making history, they're also breaking some barriers. Right, and in a field known to be a man's profession, it's said that women are the single largest untapped resource in the construction industry. And industry-wide, women only account for one in 10 construction jobs. All right, thank you so much, Courtney. You're welcome, Rob. Now, when we return, we look at work underway to attract more females into the construction trades early on in life. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, the program at the Tech Center in Far Eastern Oklahoma is trying to spark an interest in girls in working with electricity, and you won't be shocked by the results. Here's our Blaine Singletary. It's a man's world when it comes to industries like electrical engineering and construction, but a special one-day class at Northeast Tech seeks to plant the seed to encourage girls to consider this trade. We went out to see how they are getting wired. It's an electrifying morning at Northeast Technology Center in Kansas, Oklahoma. These bright-eyed students are wiring up your typical residential lighting, but you may notice something atypical about this team of electricians. This kind of came up with the idea of uh, creating a class just for girls and we ran the boys off and, and uh, put this together. That's Wade Friesen, electrical technology instructor at NTC. After hearing about similar events that other tech centers have done to introduce girls to the field, he decided to give it a shot to help diversify his program. I have one girl in the class and I've gone several years in a row without having any girls in the class, but they've always been successful and we're, we're glad to have them when they're interested. And his class is not much different than the industry at large. In 2008, women made up about 20% of graduates receiving bachelor's degrees in engineering fields. And in 2014, just 9% of people working in the construction industry were women. But this vast male majority isn't stopping these girls from taking the first step. I want to go into the Navy to be electrical. So to future my goals, I got to start somewhere and I chose MTC. Kimberly Blair is a high school sophomore and like many of the girls here today is getting an idea for what they want to do beyond high school. The goal of this No Boys Allowed Day is to give them the first taste of electrical engineering and should they choose to pursue it further, they can apply for courses like this one as soon as next fall. Experience brought me here hoping that I actually like doing this. Marie Sanford is a sophomore at Jay Public High School. I like mathematical things and I like hands-on activities and this was actually really fun. With just a little bit of instruction and guidance from Friesen, these girls <laughs> caught on quick. Less than an hour, they built a circuit, what, eight teams uh, of girls working here that, as far as we know, hadn't had any exposure to it, to have gotten everything up and working. And we achieved that goal uh, with everybody being safe. It was an experience that, quite literally, sparked their imaginations. I didn't expect to be able to work with hands-on activities and everything like that. I thought it was going to be more of a tour. And instead, being able to actually use the tools we're going to in real life and actually work on what we're actually going to is actually a lot more fun than sitting around. And their handiwork left an impression on these women who found their place in the industry. Tracy Suttle works with Crossland Construction Company. They did really good. I, I was really shocked. Uh, followed instructions very well and uh, put the project together. Suttle has been in this industry since she was the same age as many of these students. She shared her experience of being a woman in this so-called man's world and says today's project is only the tip of the iceberg. There's more than just going out and wiring a house or um, commercial building. I mean, there are boards and computers and different things that you can use electrical for. But to be able to come out of high school and already have a position where you could get a high-paying job, I think that would be really good for them. It's all about taking that opportunity, and it's one that can get even greater should they decide to go through college. Corey Miller is a project engineer who also works with Crossland, and believe it or not, she started college in the performing arts. After talking with one of my friends, he was in the construction management degree, and 
he really got me interested and I was like, you know what, I'm going to take some classes. I just was hooked. I, I, I changed my degree, I switched to construction management and I spent the next four years um, in the construction management department. And while women are still a rarity in her line of work, Miller says she hasn't been treated any differently. Not everyone looks at you as a woman and says, oh no, she can't do it. Most men do see the potential in you and allow you to, to uh, explore it and to, to um, accomplish a lot through it and support you along the way. While we probably won't see all of these faces back here next fall, the big message echoed by many today is don't let gender be a barrier for whatever job you want to do in life. My hope for the for these girls are just that if they want to do it, to do it. You know, if they if they want to go and be in the performing arts to do it, but if they want to come into the construction industry, you might be afraid, but fear is the first step of having courage. And if you've got that fear, you've got that drive, just just do it. If you got it in your head and your heart, you can do anything that you want. I mean the sky's the limit. There's no holding you back. If you think you can do it, go for it. These girls haven't let anything hold them back today. And it's unlikely anything else will. Again, Kimberly Blair. I think I'm just qualified. Anything a guy can do, do a female can. Corey Miller was also telling me just how rewarding this profession can be. She says standing outside a building like the New Hunt Tower in Rogers, Arkansas, and thinking back on all the hard work you put into it is an eternal reward. Now, if you'd like to learn more about females working in construction, streaming on our website, we have the story of a young lady we first met as a student and is now a project manager in her dream job. To see her story, just head to OKRISEN.com and look under our value added section. Want to see more stories like this? All our segments are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Well, from a distance, the Oklahoma State Capitol looks quite stately, but get up close and you can see the wrinkles on a building that turns 100 next year. During her State of the State address, Governor Mary Fallon called for an additional 120 million in bonds to repair the State Capitol building. That's on top of the 120 million already allocated. Now that's a lot of money, but one that the State Capitol Project Manager, Trey Thompson says will be well spent. And I visited with him here in our studio. Now, the Capitol's had maintenance projects, of course, over the years, and, and some of them have been more grand in scale than others. Uh, as the needs of the Capitol building has, has changed, so has the Capitol itself. There used to be many sort of wide open grand corridors uh, that have been since boxed in and were used for committee rooms and things of that nature. In fact, we have pictures from the 1960s where on the first floor of the Capitol of historic corridors where agencies had spilled out from behind the walls and they'd built up temporary walls and were doing business right there out in the corridors of the Capitol building. Gradually, as other agencies have moved out, more and more the legislature has, has taken over the building. But yes, to answer your question, really this is the first time in the Capitol building's almost 100-year-old history that a major comprehensive restoration effort of this type has been attempted. And this restoration started in 2014. Yes, we uh, got the funding in House Joint Resolution 1033 that passed in 2014. Uh, that bill went into effect of August of that year that authorized up to $120 million in bond funding to be used for the restoration and the renovation of the state capitol building. Once we got our contractors on board, we really had to undertake a comprehensive investigation. Really, we knew the, the basics of what was wrong with the building, but we had to kind of do some intrusive look to, to see what's going on behind the stone to cause the cracking and the damaging. How are the anchors that are attaching the stone to the building? Where are the damaged pieces of stone? On the interior, we had to go room by room and, and search all throughout the attic and all throughout the basement and assess, you know, what is the, what is the true state of the, uh, of the mechanical systems, of the electrical systems, of the plumbing? Our interior team generated over 50,000 pages of notes from their investigations to the true condition of the Capitol building. So now that that process has, has recently wrapped up, we have uh, gone to our oversight committee. They have approved the scope of work for the first funding amount that, that we were given by the legislature. And so now we're in the design process, getting ready for major construction to start in the next few months. And so what have you found in, in doing all these investigations? And I guess my question is, what's worse, neglect or maybe some misguided repairs? 
Both, actually. You know, what we found, what, what we expected was just neglect of repairs to be bad, and it is bad. But what we didn't expect is when we get up close to the building and we really start analyzing, there, the attempts at repairs in the past were, were really poor and they were poorly thought out. And in many cases, there was the eye toward doing it cheap and fast instead of doing something that would, that would be long lasting and that would stand the test of time. For example, on the Capitol building, we have 21 and a half miles of mortar joints all the way around the building. And mortar is a very, very important part of the exterior of your facade because it keeps water from getting in and behind the stone. What we found out is at some point in the past, they did a project to fix the mortar joints, but they used the wrong type of mortar and they, they didn't put it into the appropriate depth. So it cracked and then water started getting in behind the stone. So then they went and did a, uh, put this sort of cement like slurry over the joints that was very poor. It didn't help the problem either. They sprayed the building with a silicone sealer that only exacerbated our problems. And so those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with. And that's why we wanted to take a comprehensive investigation because when we get up there to do the work, we don't wanna be guessing. We wanna do a solution that's gonna have long lasting impact. In recent years, there have been barriers all around the Capitol. Even a few days ago, one of them blew down on, on our Austin Moore who was there shooting some video. I mean, the Capitol looks like it's under construction. Yes, it does. You know, they had to place the barriers there a few years ago because once again, that water infiltration issue, when water gets behind the stone and there are, there are iron anchors that sort of anchor it to the stone, and then when that, that, those anchors begin rusting and expanding and it presses against that stone, sooner or later something's got to give and it's not the anchor. So then you have pieces of stone that start popping off the building. And those, those barriers have been there for about four or five years because we don't want people walking up close underneath that area. And if uh, uh, unfortunately a, a piece of stone were to pop off the building and fall on someone's head. So this is a true life safety issue. It's not about just making the Capitol pretty. It's about making it functioning and where it'll last the test of time. And it is absolutely a beautiful building inside. It's a marvelous building. You know, many people who come from all over, even in its current state, will just marvel at our building. Beautiful white marble floors, uh, Alabama marble, uh, you know, beautiful. The rotunda is, is one of the show places of the entire state. Charles Banks Wilson's murals that tell the history of the state of Oklahoma. And you have, you know, the new dome that's on there and, and all of the beauty that that adds to the building. We have a marvelous Capitol building. It is a true treasure. And if we were to ever lose it, we would never get it back again. No one will ever build like this again. This building cost one and a half million dollars to build in 1917. If we were to build the exact same building starting from scratch today, we'd probably be in the neighborhood of $1.2 billion. Wow, wow. Now, you're in the first phase. Tell me about the second phase. Well, what we need to do is uh, we have about half of the money that we need to do the project. Um, uh, you know, when the legislature passed the initial $120 million, and, and we were very thankful to get it, by the way, um, we knew that we would probably need to come back for more because we knew that once we did the investigation, we would find things that, that, uh, that we didn't know about or that we might have thought we needed. And so uh, ultimately, uh, in the second phase of funding, it'll be to complete the project, to finish the building. It'll be, uh, we have the money now for on the interior to run the infrastructure through the core of the building and through the basement, but not to get out into the wings of the building uh, where all the tenant spaces are. Uh, on the exterior, we have the, the money to do a good stone restoration project, but there's other things like roofing and the tunnel and the parapet walls and the plazas and the railings and the battlements and things like that that we also need to touch. You know, scaffolding on this project, scaffolding alone is three and a half million dollars. We want to take advantage of, of, of that, not have to take down scaffolding and put it all back up again and things like that. So, so yes, uh, what we've learned from other states is get your funding up front, execute a master plan up front so that you're not starting and stopping and, and really wasting a lot of money in soft costs and, and uh, in mobilization efforts. Yeah, we'll try it certainly with something that we'll be watching. And, and really, if someone hasn't been to the Capitol, they should go. It's a marvelous building. The building is still open and visitors can still come through it and, and take tours and, and uh, all of those kinds of things. You know, what we hope after this is other states have seen their, the number of tourists after a restoration. Um, in Kansas, they saw it triple. 
What we hope after this in our Capitol building that more people will be enticed to come visit it, to learn about the history of their state, to interact with their state government. And, uh, and, and to me, that would be one of the best benefits of all for this project. All right, Trey Thompson, thank you so much. Thank you. Becoming a teacher is seldom lucrative and often hard work. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we meet some educators whose ambitions in life go well beyond what's in their paycheck. By teaching ag, you can make a positive impact in a student's life. One of the main reasons to do this job is what's the future? What do you want to see 10, 20 years from now? You could be a part of an, uh, impacting that. Education in Oklahoma, an Oklahoma show for the heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here next week. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry.